So here's our video about the globular cluster M3. This is probably a good time to say a special thanks to all the astronomers, both amateur and professional, who are letting us use their amazing pictures of these objects. But here on Deep Sky Videos, it's not just pictures we're able to show you, we're lucky enough to actually be talking to real working astronomers who've studied these objects, and in some cases like this one, even written about them. Coincidentally, my name is Michael Merrifield. I am the co-author of this book. Basically, the way it worked, we'd each write a section of the book, send it to our co-author. The co-author would then rip it to shreds. We would then get together and try and kind of put the pieces back together again. Within this book, conveniently, we made a plot for M3, the globular cluster. Messier didn't actually see it as a star cluster. He just saw it as a round, fuzzy blob. But Herschel, a few years later, with a rather better telescope, was able to see that it's actually made up of stars. Now, there's kind of two straightforward properties you can measure of any given star, which is how bright it is, it's the simplest thing you can measure, and also what colour it is, right? whether it's red, blue, or somewhere in between. And so whenever a scientist makes two measurements of something, the first thing they want to do is make a plot of one quantity against the other. In this particular case, a plot of the colour of a star versus its brightness or its magnitude is variously called a colour magnitude diagram or a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram after the two astronomers who were the first people to actually make one of these plots. So this is it. Basically, this is the colour along the bottom with red things over here, blue things over here. And this is the magnitude or the luminosity, so it's faint things at the bottom, bright things at the top. And when you do that, each of these dots is one star. So for every star, somebody's measured its colour and measured its magnitude and put a point on this diagram. One of the fascinating things about these plots is that stars aren't just randomly spread. So for example, there are no stars down here. So there's no stars which are both very red and very faint. And so there are these very definite sequences where you find stars and other places where you find no stars at all. And that's fascinating because that tells you that actually there's something to understand about the properties of stars from a diagram like this. For example, we know that stars down here are on a thing known as the main sequence. And stars on the main sequence are stars that are like the sun that are currently turning hydrogen into helium in their cores. And as you go further up, you see some of the more advanced stages of evolution where a star might be turning helium into carbon or carbon into heavier elements within its core. The least massive stars are at the bottom here. And as you work your way up the main sequence, you get more and more massive stars. Where the main sequence ceases to be populated, these are the stars that have just recently died. And because we know how long stars that should be here would live for, we can actually use that to figure out how old this cluster is. So in this case, we know this particular globular cluster is about 12 billion years old. There are actually a few stars that are above that point, and they're called blue stragglers, because this is the blue side of the diagram, the red side of the diagram. So these are stars which are fairly blue, and they're actually beyond the point where there shouldn't be any stars anymore, because stars this massive should already have blown up, gone away, and not be there anymore. It's still not really quite understood where these blue stragglers come from. It's probably something to do with the fact that globular clusters are incredibly dense collections of stars. And so one of the things that you can actually do is you can have two less massive stars merging with each other to create a massive star again. I've heard for this type of book it's been quite successful. Has it made you very rich? Uh, it's sold pretty well. It's sold about getting on for 10,000 copies now, I think. Um, it's, a, it's used as a textbook, which is the way to, you know, to actually sell a decent number of books. Um, but unfortunately, it's a kind of graduate level textbook. If you want to really make money out of astronomy books, you've got to write an undergraduate text. So there's M3 and Blue Stragglers. And if this kind of thing is up your alley, I should point out I actually do another channel called 60 Symbols. I know a lot of people watching actually came here from 60 Symbols, but for those of you who don't know about it, it's worth a look. And I'll also quickly point out I'm doing another new channel at the moment called Number File, all about the joys of numbers and mathematics, but in a quirky kind of way. It's also worth a look if you get time.